All right, well, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar. Our topic is wildlife behavior in response to traffic disturbance. My name is Mike Sintetos. I'm the policy director for the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Um, before we get started, I'll just do a quick introduction. This is part of a monthly webinar series sponsored by the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. NCST is a part of the University Transportation Centers program administered by the U.S. Department of Transportation. We're a consortium of six universities around the country focused on advancing environmentally sustainable transportation through cutting edge research, direct policy engagement, and education of our future leaders. Uh, we have a mailing list that we'd like to invite you to sign up for. Uh, it's at ncst.ucdavis.edu to get notifications about upcoming webinars and our current research. Today's webinar will last an hour and a half. We'll have a presentation from Dr. Fraser Schilling of the University of California, Davis. And then we'll have two guest responses, first from Rebecca Friss at the Wildlife Conservation Board, and then from Sheikh Moynudin of the California Department of Transportation. And then once, uh, once we're done hearing from those three folks, we'll open it up to, um, for your questions and answers. Um, there's a Q&A feature in the Zoom webinar that we'll be using. Um, to type in. So if you hover over the, the bottom part of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A box. Go ahead and type in your questions in there and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. We will be recording the webinar and it'll be available with closed captioning on our website along with the slides hopefully within the next day or so. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our our presenter, um, Dr. Fraser Schilling. Fraser is the co-director of the Road Ecology Center and a faculty member of the Transportation Technology and Policy Group at the University of California, Davis. And Fraser, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thanks very much, Mike. And um, as Mike said, I'm with the Road Ecology Center at UC Davis, and we focus on uh, quite a lot of different things, including the topic today of wildlife behavior in response to traffic disturbance. We also look at wildlife uh, behavior um, in response to roadsides in um, their natural environment. Uh, we do work with camera trapping, um, noise and light measurements. Uh, we also look at things like sea level rise, that's the photograph in the bottom right, and how we can better adapt to um, new uh, sea elevations that we're experiencing um, these days more and more. Um, some of you may know that we have the California Roadkill Observation System, um, and this, a uh, map I'm highlighting here shows some of our data from that system. We have close to 100,000 um, points of wildlife vehicle conflict over the last uh, six to 10 years. And then most recently, we've been looking at COVID-19 related responses of traffic and traffic crashes and greenhouse gas emissions, mostly in California, but including in uh, the rest of the US. So we have a diverse uh, array of research, which has allowed us to focus on the question today of how wildlife behavior uh, and wildlife distribution might change in response to traffic dis disturbance. Most of the work I'm gonna talk about was carried out by Amy Collins and a group of undergraduate research assistants um, that spread out throughout California and helped carry out a very large um, research project over a three year period. Um, we had great assistance from Travis Longcor, an expert in light and ecology uh, and light and wildlife. And also Winston Vickers, um, a well-known and awesome <laughs> mountain lion researcher in Southern California uh, who, who helped us out with understanding a lot of the Southern California crossing structures, especially when it related to predators, including the mountain lion. The research was sponsored by the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, it was supported by um, the USDOT through the UTC programs, as Mike mentioned. There's also uh, a lot of support from Federal Highway Administration through a separate contract for the research here. Caltrans is also a big player in, in helping us uh, with NCST research and also with the project I'm gonna talk about today. We had uh, a lot of individuals assist us uh, in different ways. I want to especially thank Clark Stevens uh, from the uh, Santa Monica Mountains RCD and, and a landscape um, designer in his own right. Uh, Dr. David Waitchin works for me, Rich Coddington and Jamie Borden who work for Winston Vickers, uh, Ben Benet, Colin Rapp, uh, Catherine Lee and, and a variety of other 
undergraduate researchers and, um, and faculty here at UC Davis. So I wanna start with the main messages that I'll be talking about so that we're, we get these up front. These are the somewhat the things that we found. There's still some open questions, but um, this shows the relevance of our research. The first is that wildlife are variably sensitive to traffic disturbance. And people in the past have found um, some indications that wildlife are sensitive to anthropogenic noise, um, to vibration through the ground. Um, there's also research on light sensitivity of different wildlife species, one of the more uh, famous and media friendly being nesting sea turtles. And so there's a lot of evidence that wildlife do respond to noise and light. And the specific kind of noise and light that we're talking about today is from vehicles or traffic. This variable sensitivity can affect ecosystems through changing the distribution of wildlife themselves. So you can imagine if the predator and the prey species have different sensitivity to traffic disturbance, then they may be distributed differently across the landscape than they would be naturally. Uh, there may be impacts to juvenile dispersal, resilience to climate change, and other um, ecological impacts. The mechanism for this impact uh, is implied in the word sensitivity, and it could be that wildlife behavior in response to traffic is resulting in changes to distribution of wildlife and their ability to visit the roadside, which is important for the main part of our question, which is to do with wildlife crossing structures. And the conclusion is that um, we think it's at least somewhat possible to design the approaches to wildlife crossing structures to reduce these impacts and hopefully improve wildlife use of the crossing structures themselves. Uh, some of the background for this um, at the Road Ecology Center, we've been looking at what we call the road effect zone, uh, the term that um, came from Richard Foreman, uh, the initiator of the idea of road ecology 10 to 15, 20 years ago, <laughs> a long time ago. And uh, the road effect zone is a geographic area around any roadway where the road infrastructure itself and then the traffic, the vehicles um, also have impacts and those spread out from the roadside. So the graph, the chart on the left shows different types of impacts in this, in this list on the left-hand side. And they go, the impacts extend different distances, according to published research, different distances from the roadway up to kilometers or more. I mean, some of these effects like genetic fragmentation occur at the landscape scale, so they go quite far. Other effects such as microclimate might be in the immediate roadside of the, um, whatever road it is that we're talking about. These road effects are three-dimensional, and this includes noise and light. And this means that the effects are radiating across the landscape, into the atmosphere, into the ground, uh, that's a really important one for ground dwelling animals that traffic vibration can actually change how they occur in the ground. And so these are 3D effects that radiate out from any roadway uh, that has traffic on it. The nexus with how do we deal with these problems in, um, in the DOT environment, in the highway environment or roadway environment, uh, there's different policies and, and um, sometimes statutes that are relevant. And it begins with, um, and this is, I think a lot of people are familiar with this idea, if you, if you bring into the planning stage an awareness of some kind of environmental impact, uh, then you can avoid it in advance. And so that's a, that's a pretty critical idea. And beyond that, once we get into project development, this could be maintenance, uh, could be culverts, bridges, or it could be a whole new roadway. There's a series of programming and project development steps that each have their own uh, types of laws that apply or policies. But the earlier that we bring in this idea of the road effect zone, um, the better we're gonna be able to avoid these kinds of impacts. All the way th through project design, which is something I'll talk about, about today, where we use these road effect zone impacts to determine what could a project design be that minimizes these impacts. And finally, and really importantly, um, once uh, projects are built, uh, if we monitor them and maintain them well, uh, then we can understand their effectiveness, then we can make sure we, we adaptively manage the roadway system. So the immediate background for today is that traffic is loud and variable. Uh, it's naturally variable. 
on any roadway, say from day to night or weekend to weekday. And the noise from traffic can extend um, very long distances into the surrounding landscape, whether it's an urban landscape or a rural landscape. And generally, the more traffic there is, so I'm looking at this chart here in the middle, the more traffic, uh, the more noise. And uh, therefore, the larger the area that's going to be affected by noise. This map on the right is for State Route 99 in California, and it's showing the area around the highway uh, that can be expected to experience noise above 40 decibels, which is about the lowest noise that we think might be affecting something like sensitive birds or, or other animals. And so this, is, this probably describes the furthest distance that a road effect might occur. And you can see this number right here, this is 2,000 meters, so up to two to two and a half kilometers away from the highway, you might expect to have noise levels that disturb the most sensitive species. Now, as we all know, uh, recently traffic levels have gone down quite a bit, and now they're coming back up. And this is shown in the top right in response to the stay-at-home guidance. Um, this is change in traffic volumes. Uh, this is Los Angeles County I'm showing here. Uh, but it could be San Francisco or other counties as well. And there's been a serious uh, drop off in traffic and a gradual increase again. So that's another kind of variability which we haven't experienced before in this idea that traffic is loud and variable. Another important characteristic of traffic is at night, uh, it is not only noisy, but it's also bright uh, from the lights. I'm going to kind of ignore the street light and residential light part of the equation and talk mostly about um, vehicle born light. So on the left, uh, this is looking at um, noise propagation across a real landscape. And in this case, it's the location of the proposed wildlife overcrossing at Liberty Canyon. So this area right here is where the overcrossing is proposed and the um, the sampled sound levels, noise levels at, these, at this location are fairly high. Uh, so in this case, 65 to 78 um, uh, dBA, uh, A-weighted decibels right along the roadside. And so, and then the noise dissipates as you go back away from the highway, but it's not in a, in a very uniform way. Um, you can see that there's a lot of variability with some areas um, being very loud. So for example, this orange dot or these orange dots in back away from the highway are relatively loud, 55 to 65 dBA, but that's because they're on a ridge line. And so there's a direct line of sight or line of sound from the highway to those points on the ridge line. And then some of these green dots that are even closer uh, to the highway, uh, 35 to 45 dBA, these are in gullies or swales that are protected from the highway. So it's a very quiet area, even though it's relatively close to the highway. So it's a very complex uh, process of noise distribution away from the highway. Over here on the right, this is looking at light intensity and the same kind of um, different physics is involved, but some, of the, some similar ideas. Uh, generally near highways, you're gonna have very bright at night uh, conditions, but you may have pockets of uh, darkness. So in this case, um, this green dot, uh, this is on Highway 62 out in District 8. Uh, shout out to District 8 people who are on the, on the webinar. Um, this green dot here is about 100 feet from the highway edge, but it's down in a gully and protected by vegetation, so it's very dark. So even though it's very close to the highway, um, it's a very dark location. So the propagation of light away from the highway can also be fairly complex and really somewhat difficult to predict. Um, I do a lot with geographic information systems and modeling, and it is possible to do some prediction of sound and light propagation, um, but it actually might be quicker to go out and do field measurements than to come up with the perfect model for any given place. So the question then is, are underpasses effective to pass wildlife if they are potentially or immediately affected by noise and light. And so here's some examples, uh, one of which was built for wildlife, this box culvert here. 
which is relatively close to the road deck in terms of the top of the culvert is a few feet below the road deck. This is in District 3, Caltrans District 3. And the, the structure is quite effective. We've had camera traps here um, pretty soon after it was constructed. And um, there's wildlife fencing and, and a lot of wildlife do, do go through here. But it, you can see that it's the, the approach to the structure is also very close to the roadway. And this is going to vary from one road to the other, um, how far away the opening is and the tunnel is from the source of noise um, on top of the roadway. And also the type of material seems to affect noise too. So a concrete bridge deck versus a steel bridge deck is going to have different kinds of noise. Um, whether or not the, the roadway is screened in any way by vegetation or something else um, would also affect how much light um, is available um, at the crossing structure. So all of these different structures, whether they were built for wildlife or not, are going to be affected in different ways by noise and light. And the question is how effective are they are passing wildlife. So some of the basis for the study today is to look at this, what we call the approach zone to any crossing structure. So this gray area is a road. The red um, box here in the background is an underpass uh, of some kind, bridge or culvert. And these triangle areas are just geometric representations of an approach zone for an animal uh, coming up to the structure. Uh, there's various things that can affect uh, potentially affect animal use of crossing structures, including the dimensions and material of the crossing structure itself, human and other activity at the crossing structure. But the thing that we're most concerned about is how does the approach zone, the characteristics of the approach zone affect uh, the use of the crossing structure, uh, and especially how does noise and light coming from the road affect that area. This is something that's not been studied very much, and there's not um, any consistent design principles for how you deal with these issues. So it's um, definitely an interesting area of pursuit. The workflow for our project, uh, we began with establishing this idea of uh, the approach zones might be noisy and bright and uh, wildlife behavior and um, wild wildlife might be put off by those conditions. And we investigated this at the state scale. We processed and managed our data through our CAM1 system, wildlifeobserver.net, if anybody wants to check that out, uh, including a process we have for removing false positive camera trap images, counting humans and vehicles, uh, summarizing events uh, for species or by, um, by date, et cetera. We also looked at wildlife behavior using a tool called BARIS, and I'll describe that uh, tool further down in the presentation. Um, I put the URL here for anybody who's interested. So it's a behavioral analysis tool uh, that's commonly used by people who study wildlife behavior. Uh, we looked at different statistical models that would best explain um, the data that we um, were collecting for different questions, such as wildlife species distribution or um, wildlife behavior. And then finally, um, we've, we're engaged in the middle of a project right now of looking at wildlife responsive design of wildlife crossing structures. So how can we, uh, this is a new concept, how can we design wildlife crossing structures so they're actually responsive to wildlife behavior and not make assumptions about that wildlife behavior. Uh, this shows, this map over here on the right shows the distribution of our sites. I put a red box around the Liberty Canyon site because we did do more data collection there um, and it's, uh, it's a special site in a lot of ways, uh, especially to the people who work down there. Uh, and then we included the other Southern California sites, Central California, Northern California. So there are 26 sites throughout California. And the structures that we were looking at were under anywhere from one to five lane in each direction um, highways uh, over three year period, 2016 to 2019. We measured, uh, we had camera traps out of these locations. We measured noise uh, in different ways and also light at night, um, new moon nights. And this little map here in the bottom shows the relative position of, of one study area of our measurements in what we call the background area compared to the crossing structure. So we would have sampling camera traps and noise and light at the crossing structure, and then also at a distance um, from the structure to get an idea of what wildlife were were present and what they were doing out there in the background areas. 
The noise measurements we're using uh, Tenma sound measure uh, sound devices sound measuring devices. Which, uh, if anybody is interested in how you do that, you can feel free to contact me. And this uh, chart in the bottom right, or, or diagram in the bottom right, shows um, these sound meters at different distances from the structure. And also, the blue boxes are camera traps uh, looking at animals coming in or coming towards or going away from any crossing structure. Uh, and then the, the light intensity camera, uh, light intensity measurements were taken with a customized camera from Travis Longcore at UCLA. And the images here in the top right show the light intensity uh, image on the, on the left side, and then the color temperature on the right. And so um, LED lights, for example, LED lights and sodium lights have different um, color temperature for the, for the light coming out of say a, a street light or a headlight, and that can affect wildlife behavior in different ways, depending on the color temperature. We, uh, in the case of Liberty Canyon, uh, we took measurements um, across transects in a slightly different way from the, the other sites. And so the map with the yellow dots, uh, those are noise and camera trap, just noise measurement and camera trap uh, distributions across the study area, the approach zone. So as a reminder, the, the crossing structure is right here, the proposed crossing structure location. So we're interested in what wildlife are doing on their way to this location. And then we also took light measurements and transects away from the highway uh, through these two different approach zones. Here's, this is a ridge line uh, coming up to the Liberty Canyon area, and then this is a creek bed. So two different kinds of environments. Um, approaching the proposed crossing structure. Uh, we looked at the distribution of wildlife between the background areas and then adjacent to the crossing structures. And we also looked at their activity relative to different levels of traffic disturbance, um, the attributes of the approach zone or the, or the crossing structure, human activity, et cetera. Over um, 9,360 trap nights, uh, we collected over 28,000 observations of wildlife and we're able to capture 32 mammal species. We also got birds and, and some reptiles, but we focused on mammals for, um, for this study. And so here's the first main message, uh, main finding, is that across the 26 sites, there was a difference between the species richness, the number of species, and also the types of species between the underpass and the background. And so, these were all underpasses because in California, we've only recently had one overcrossing built. Um, and then obviously Liberty Canyon is, a, is another one that will be built. So these are all underpasses and the background areas are about a kilometer away. So about three quarters of a mile away from the structure. And this difference, which is statistically significant, implies that there are wildlife in the background areas that are not approaching the underpasses. So this was, as a reminder, done over a three-year period across 26 sites. And in each pair of background area and underpass, um, we generally found that difference. So for example, we might find spotted skunk in the background, but not the undercrossing in some location. Um, or uh, found a flying squirrel in the background at one location, but we've never seen a flying squirrel at the underpass. So there's these differences uh, that occurred across all of the underpasses that we investigated, the 26 sites uh, throughout California. And so the question is then, how does this occur? Um, what best explains that distribution? So uh, using a generalized linear model in R, uh, this work was done um, by Amy Collins, the graduate student who um, was recently in the Road Ecology Center. And she looked at different uh, explanations for this distribution and found that the, there's, there's some kinds of explanations. So I'm looking at the table here on the bottom right. Um, things like uh, latitude, so where you are in the world or elevation can explain species richness, but the attribute, the highway attribute that we're interested in, noise, the best explanation for this um, species richness difference was the minimum noise um, at a crossing structure. 
And so that's a little different idea from the maximum noise uh, and what it is implying that if you never have quiet times, you may not have time for sensitive animals to approach and use a crossing structure. And this was a statistically significant um, uh, correlation with species richness, meaning the louder the minimum noise was, the fewer species that you would find. Uh, we also looked at things like um, crossing structure attributes, width, height, and the cross-sectional area, uh, and then human activity, and those did not explain the different difference in species richness. With with noise, um, with loudness, so looking at instead the minimum noise, but the louder end of the spectrum, um, there was an interesting relationship between the frequency of animal visits and the um, L90 uh, close to maximum noise. So this is not maximum noise, but the um, loud end of the spectrum, where we had this inverse U shape. And what this means is that the frequency of visits, so the number of times that animals are visiting a structure, visits per day, varied in this inverse U shape with loudness. And the louder the traffic noise, um, at first there was an increase in the number of visits of animal animals, and then there was the decrease. And this is a kind of a, a strange thing maybe to think about, but one important um, thing here is that where you have very low traffic noise and very low traffic volumes um, is often in um, higher elevation in wild areas, remote areas. And we think of those places as great for wildlife, but they are also places where we tend to have lower species diversity. So alpine areas in the Sierra Nevada will have lower species diversity than the lower foothills, um, but they also have less traffic. As you increase traffic, you're also usually and so therefore increasing traffic noise, you're also usually in lower elevations, nearer developed areas. And these are actually more productive areas and you're tending, you're gonna have more wildlife present. And that might explain this increase in, um, in frequency of visits, meaning the number of animals that are approaching the structure. As noise further increases, that's usually a sign that you are near an urban area. Uh, and it's also, the highway is generally louder and that may be intimidating enough that fewer species, fewer individuals of species approach um, the structure at all. In this particular analysis, um, light had no relationship uh, or did not determine the frequency of visits in any statistically significant way. One thing that's interesting about this inverse U effect is it's very similar to the animals um, being, the roadkill, the animals being killed on the road relative to traffic volumes. And this is from a paper from 2003 by Andreas Saylor showing that the, this roadkill curve, this inverse U curve is very similar shape to our animal visits to the crossing structure, meaning that at very low traffic volumes, fewer animals are being killed than at intermediate traffic volumes. But as you increase traffic volumes, you actually decrease the number of animals killed. And that may be because they are just not approaching the highway at all. There's an aversion effect, and you can see this in this repelled curve. So this is this um, earlier finding of frequency of visits to a crossing structure is similar to the um, animals being killed on the road surface, suggesting a general um, phenomenon of uh, low, very low traffic. Animals may be successfully crossing roadways or through crossing structures at intermediate traffic volumes. Um, they are using crossing structures, but they're also going over the road surface and being killed. And at high traffic volumes, they're not doing either. They're not approaching the road surface and they're not approaching the crossing structure. So this kind of finding are really important for understanding places like Liberty Canyon. Um, this, when it's constructed, will be the largest wildlife crossing, wildlife overcrossing in the world. And the projected cost um, is probably more like 67 million and not the 87 million that's shown in this uh, new story. And it's, it's a crossing structure that will go across 10 lanes of traffic. So it's, a, it's gonna be, a, um, it's quite a challenge. Uh, in the Liberty Canyon area, we, as I had mentioned earlier, we did some detailed transects of uh, wildlife distribution, noise and light. 
And this graph on the left shows the probability of bobcat occurring in, a, in an area based on camera traps relative to the noise in that area. So in quieter areas, lower maximum noise, there was a greater probability of, of seeing bobcat in that area using camera traps. And as you get closer to the highway and the noise levels go up, the probability went down to zero of finding a bobcat. The, these sound levels, maximum noise levels here about 70, are characteristic of the approach zone uh, to Liberty Canyon. So that's a really important finding uh, for helping to design the Liberty Canyon overcrossing so that it works for all species. One mechanism uh, for why we observe these different sensitivities or different distributions is that wildlife behavior uh, in response to the instantaneous noise and light from traffic might explain their distribution. Um, so we used BARIS, which is Behavioral Observation Research Interactive Software, and it allows a user to annotate a video and say what's occurring in the video of an animal. So this is from a series of video cameras that we installed uh, in all 26 locations throughout California. And um, the user, meaning the analyst, indicates how much time is spent on different activities uh, that, of the animal. It could be walking, uh, standing still, uh, foraging, etc. Uh, we built an instance of this tool at this URL down here in the bottom right, wildlifeobserver.net slash behavior ID. Uh, so you can use that to get an idea of how to carry out this kind of investigation. Or you can download this um, specialized uh, software, Boris, um, from the website I gave earlier. And so using this tool, we were able to look at how wildlife activity varies with something like sound. And here's an example for mule deer, which is important throughout many places in the West, uh, and including California, partly for ecosystem conservation reasons, but also most, probably mostly for safety reasons. Collisions with deer are one of the most common types of collisions with, uh, with large animals, not all animals, but large animals, and can be dangerous for the driver. And so crossing structures and fencing and things like that are often built with deer in mind. The interesting thing about deer is they're prey species and they actually respond to noise and uh, traffic in a slightly different way than you might think. So the chart here in the middle shows the top on the y-axis the time that a deer spends being non-vigilant. In other words, it seems relaxed, it's not looking, um, looking around for predators, etc. And at low noise levels, uh, deer spend more time being, uh, sorry, they spend less time being non-vigilant. So they're, they tend to be vigilant at lo low noise levels, and as noise levels increase, they become less um, vigilant. They're more relaxed, they're foraging, etc. And you can see um, over here on the right that it varies a little bit with the traffic volumes um, so consistent with this, with this relationship with traffic noise. When traffic is continuous, and that usually means it's louder, you have more cars and trucks going by, um, the time spent being vigilant is very low. If under this, um, this green um, uh, square here indicates when traffic is distinguishable, when individual vehicles are distinguishable, so they're going by less frequently, uh, so there's a more stochastic noise, uh, there's a slightly higher time spent being uh, vigilant. And when there's no traffic at all, um, then um, deer tend to be less vigilant. So in these intermediate traffic uh, levels, uh, deer are a little bit more vigilant. But looking at this chart over on the left, what this indicates is that when traffic is very loud, uh, deer are more relaxed. And this is related to the idea of a human shield um, or human effect barrier where predators tend to be more sensitive to noise. And so at higher noise levels, there may be fewer predators around. So deer and other prey species can be more relaxed. So using this idea of wildlife and noise and the effects of wildlife distribution, uh, effects on wildlife distribution of noise. So here's the bobcat chart over on the left. We started to look at the Liberty Canyon area uh, so this wildlife overcrossing um, and how you could change the characteristics of the crossing and the approach zone to the crossing 
So if they're for wildlife that do avoid traffic noise, we can get them safely across this structure. And so this diagram in the lower, uh, in the center here, uh, thanks to Clark Stevens uh, for providing the data for, for a lot of the, the next part of what I'm going to talk about. This shows the possible um, structure, morphological structure of the crossing in relation to the surrounding landscape. So the crossing structure where animals are going to go is indicated by this two-headed red arrow. And animals, uh, we want them to go back and forth across this crossing structure. And that means they have to get there, uh, which sounds uh, simple-minded, but um, obviously if animals don't ever find the bottom of the structure because they're afraid of something, then they won't use it. So the yellow arrows indicate um, animals approaching from the north side, which is a higher elevation uh, and slope coming down facing towards the highway. The highway is this area going under the structure through the middle. And so we want animals to follow these yellow arrows um, to the crossing structure and go across. And we want the, it to be in both directions, but we especially want them to come from the north because there's some genetic isolation to the south. And so how do we get these animals to come down this hillside? You can see in the picture in the top right, come down this hillside, they're facing traffic the whole way, or come up from this creek area over to the bottom right and get onto this bridge. Um, here's a, a design uh, drawing from Clark Stevens again and shows this landscape in a slightly different orientation. And you can see the areas to the north, so that's the upper part of this, this um, contour map where the black lines are close together, that indicates very steep slopes. And so you have the steep, uh, the steep ridge line facing towards the highway and we want wildlife to come down to the crossing structure, which is, is this green uh, structure across the highway. We also have a creek uh, that's coming down towards the bridge. And that's actually where we see most wildlife uh, moving. Uh, and the Park Service, which has had cameras out here for a long time and collared animals, they tend to move down this creek corridor. But when they get to the bottom, they're still faced with the highway. So we had this problem of how do we get the animals up out of these noisy, bright areas, up onto the bridge, cross over the highway and down the other side. And there's a, there's a lot of different ways that people have approached this problem, primarily for human, um, where humans live, or for parks, and, but very, very uh, seldom for wildlife. And these um, structures include walls, so sound walls. You can see in the bottom right, there's a picture of a sound wall, which functions as a light wall at the same time. Uh, there's a berm, a vegetated berm, shown in this picture here. Um, these are all um, either designs uh, or photographs of real places. And then this is a vegetated wall, which so it's a regular wall, a concrete wall. It actually has a, a plexiglass screen on top and then vegetation on the backside on a slope. So these are all different possible kinds of structures you can use to inhibit noise and light propagation across a landscape. And in this case, in Liberty Canyon, get animals onto that bridge. Um, so we call this idea wildlife responsive design, meaning it takes into account how wildlife respond to traffic noise and light or other road and traffic characteristics and helps, um, helps them get away from that because the critical thing is getting animals to this bridge. And so this is showing the highway as this curved band uh, consistent elevation going through the middle. Um, this is the diagram on the left. You can see the hillsides um, shaded coming down towards the bridge. And then the, the and so the right-hand side of this diagram is the north and the left-hand side is the south. And we want animals to go across that bridge. So how do we get them there when traffic is bright and noisy? And so some very preliminary designs are on the bottom right here showing um, some possible solutions that we are uh, engaged in right now. Uh, these include modifying the part of the approach zone near the creek so that there we have these berms that run alongside the creek and it allows animals to go behind the berms and therefore be protected from the noise and light because they're in a shadow essentially uh, and migrate up towards the approach of the bridge. There's a limit to how you can distribute these. There's waterways that come down so that explains these gaps in the berms that allow water through. Um, there's other 
um, uh, geomorphological characteristics of the landscape that are going to limit how much you can do with berms. But you have this idea of string of berms and then also a wall. And this is this red outlined area running alongside the highway. So a wall um, adjacent to the highway. And this combination of berms and walls provides you with the ability to block noise and light and provide wildlife a way to get to the foot of the bridge. And uh, once they get to the foot of the bridge, um, then the design work for the landscape is done. And now it's the design of the bridge that is going to make it a safe, safe way across. So I'd like to thank a lot of people. Um, some of them are shown on this uh, slide here. Uh, we've had an incredible range of undergraduate student interns over the last four years. Um, often they graduate and go on to jobs. They usually stick around for anywhere from one to four years. Uh, we've had them from freshman to graduation and actually one has come back as a, as a postgraduate student um, to work with us as well. Uh, people from other institutions. And then in the top left is a picture of Amy Collins who did most of the field research and analysis that I've been talking about. So I wanna thank everybody for joining in. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand off to our guest respondents. Um, and um, so Mike, I think you're taking over at this point. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Fraser. That's a great presentation. Um, clearly sparking some interest already because we've got some questions coming in. So before we uh, move over to our uh, guest respondents, just a reminder that um, the, the Q&A box is at the bottom of the screen, so you can type in your questions there. Um, it, it helps us keep track of them better if you use the Q&A box rather than the chat box, so um, we'd appreciate that. So um, before we get to those questions, we do have a couple um, folks that we'd like to introduce to you that, to um, comment on this research in, in the context of their own work. Um, the first uh, person I'd like to introduce is Rebecca Friss. She's the Assistant Ex Executive Director of the Wildlife Conservation Board, um, which certainly has a long history of working on these issues generally, but also specifically um, has invested in this uh, Liberty Canyon area that we've been talking about. So, um, Rebecca, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Good. Hey, Fraser, could you um, put up the front page, the WCB front web page initially, and then I'll talk about this solicitation at the oh, end. Okay, yeah, good. sorry thank, about that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. Uh, my name is Rebecca Friss. I work for the Wildlife Conservation Board, and I'm going to zoom out a little bit um, and just talk for a couple minutes about the Wildlife Conservation Board, our role in uh, wildlife corridors and wildlife crossings, and, and then a specific opportunity that we have for funding for wildlife corridors available right now. So the Wildlife Conservation Board has been around for a long time, since 1947. We are an independent board in the state of California. And we work very closely and are in part supported by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So a lot of what we do is to support the department, uh, but we also work with a lot of other nonprofits, land trusts, agencies, et cetera. So, you know, our primary function is to implement some grant programs for wildlife conservation and also public recreation. And we are right now um, funding about 14 different programs that support restoration, acquisition, and public recreation throughout the state. So we do work statewide. Um, so our, we do have additional information on all of our programs at uh, wcb.ca.gov. And so I do encourage you to look there for additional information. Um, in general, we're spending you know, 75 to $100 million per year and support about 100 different projects throughout the state that we take to our board, a seven member board uh, that meets about four times a year. And our monies generally are coming from state bonds. Uh, we also do have a specific habitat conservation fund, which in large part is protecting corridors for deer and mountain lion. So very much for the type of research that Fraser just explained. Uh, so we recently updated our strategic plan and that's really what's guiding our work for the next five years. And these priorities are very uh, closely aligned to the Natural Resources Agency's priorities as well. And so those include uh, protecting biodiversity, climate change resilience, um, and landscape connectivity. 
And that includes this work supporting uh, wildlife corridors, uh, particularly. So over the years, we funded numerous programs uh, that are targeted on specifically enhancing wildlife corridors across the landscape. And as we've already talked about a little bit, we've for decades been very involved in the Liberty Canyon area. Uh, so WCB has provided over $10 million for purchase of parcels in the area that allow for that wildlife movement. And we've done this with numerous partners, such as the local nonprofits and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy. Uh, we more recently just provided funding to restore habitat at the Liberty Canyon undercrossing. So that was to help uh, pr promote movement of, of animals uh, during this time before the actual new overcrossing can be developed. And we even just in the last six months provided additional funding to revegetate some of that habitat uh, at that undercrossing that was damaged due to fire. So that work is ongoing now. Um, and then as you know, the decades of work that have gone on in this area, we will be taking a project to our board this August to contribute $5 million to the new Liberty Canyon overpass. So we are super excited to be part of that team and to contribute to the uh, benefits for wildlife in, in this particular um, area. So um, a particular interest for this group is that we do have specific funding for wildlife corridors right now. Um, in the last number of years, we've gotten bond funds under Prop 1 and Prop 68. And so right now, one of the, the um, programs under Prop 68 is specific to wildlife corridors and fish passage. So you'll see there the 2020 public solicitation notice. Uh, last year, we funded a handful of wildlife corridor uh, projects, both planning and implementation. And so right now, this solicitation is open. We've got about $17 million available, again, for planning and implementation projects. Uh, solicitation priorities include constructions of wildlife overcrossings and undercrossings, uh, restoration and enhancement of habitats that provide visual screens for corridors, and then also removal of impediments for fish passage. So, um, and there's priorities for both of those things, both corridors and fish passage that we're using a California Department of Fish and Wildlife data for. So uh, there is one note that this funding is specific to actual infrastructure projects and planning that leads to actual infrastructure projects. So it's not supporting uh, just uh, actual science or monitoring per se. Uh, the language in Prop 68 is very specific to implementation of infrastructure projects. So, uh, point on that. So, for any folks that are in, interested in this funding application, you need to act fast. Uh, it's been open for a little while now, and so it's actually closing this Thursday. Um, but the good news is it's a pre-application process. So, there's a relatively simple form, a two to three page pages of information that would need to be filled out to get a pre-application in. And I encourage you to, to go ahead and do that. This can be found, again, at wcb.ca.gov under our Grant Opportunities page, which is on the Grant tab um, on our website. So please uh, take a look there. Also, if you go to the front page of our website, and there's Fraser showing you the, the actual page there where you're going to find that solicitation over under available opportunities. And then this is our front page um, where you also can find it under our news items. And then if you do want to get um, information for future Wildlife Conservation Board solicitations, there's a button there you can see on the right that says subscribe. So I'd encourage you to, to get on our email list and that would let you know when all of our solicitations are out and available. So for any folks that are interested in the solicitation happening now, I encourage you to, to jump on and, and take advantage of that pre-application process. And you know, we actually also have programs that are doing restoration and acquisition throughout the state for, for a whole bunch of different reasons. So for those of you maybe that hadn't heard about us in the past, um, I encourage you to reach out to us um, now if you have ideas for other projects throughout the state that benefit fish and wildlife. So we are continually interested in expanding our partnership um, and working more closely with the department and Caltrans on transportation issues. We wanna make sure that we see this type of research get incorporated to the projects that we're funding. And so we're committed to continue our work uh, with connectivity and corridors and um, are, are interested in 
gaining new partners and talking about other ideas you guys have in this area. So um, again, if you do have other thoughts on projects or ideas, please give me a, con give me a call or an email and I can connect you with the right people at, WA at WCB to see if we have appropriate funding for that. And with that high level uh, overview, I will stop there and hand it back. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, our, our second guest respondent um, I'd like to introduce now is Sheik Moynudin. Um, he's, the transport, uh, he's the senior transportation engineer with Caltrans District 7 in Southern California. Um, and he's also the project manager for this Liberty Canyon Wildlife Corridor project that we've, uh, that we've been talking about. So uh, Sheik, I'll turn it over to you for uh, your remarks. And I'll make sure you're unmuted. There we go. Okay. Try now. Okay. Good. good morning, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yep. That sounds good. I think I was trying to unmute you while you were unmuting yourself. So sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for uh, inviting me to this forum. Uh, this is Sheik Moinudin uh, working for Caltrans. And those of you uh, who doesn't know, uh, Caltrans stands for California Department of Transportation. And we're a state agency and the builder, owner, and operator of the state highway system. So now as part of all of our projects, we usually strive to enhance wildlife movement across our system and spend uh, millions of dollars in the process. So now currently, uh, we are working on one of the most aggressive wildlife crossing in the U.S., if not in the world. Uh, it will cross over Route 101 freeway uh, which basically carries about 375,000 vehicles a day. Uh, this structure will be about 165 feet wide and 200 feet long. The cost is approximately $88 million. Uh, I know Frazier mentioned about $67 million, and he's right. That's the uh, cost of the uh, structures, but uh, another $20 million uh, is about the engineering cost. And Mostly the, the funding is coming from private funding, private donations, uh, and some state grants. Uh, so basically, we are, uh, we, are in the, uh, we are basically designing the project. However, the funding uh, part is coming from uh, the National Wildlife Federation. And if some of you probably already know, and probably she's already on this uh, webinar, Beth Pratt, she's in the forefront to raise the fund. And from Caltrans side, I'm managing this project uh, to its completion. And I'd like to stop it here, unless you have any questions. So Sheik, there, there are a couple of questions just about um, design of the structure and, and, and what it's gonna look like and, and maybe, um, maybe timeline that you can speak to. Could you talk a little bit just about um, some of the kind of um, well, may, maybe maybe we'll start with kind of timeline of, of when um, when it would be completed, and then there are a couple other questions just about um, you know uh, vegetation along it and um, things like that. Then I, maybe either you or Fraser could could just cover briefly. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, okay. So this project right now is in a design phase, uh, and uh, uh, we anticipate that to be completed by sometimes around June, July of next year. Uh, another, another, give it another three to four months uh, to advertise the project, bringing in the uh, contractor, and then another two years from that point on uh, to the completion. And it's gonna be, uh, like I said before, it's gonna be a 165 feet wide by 200 feet long uh, vegetated bridge over 101. Great. So um, transitioning a little bit from our, um, from our guest respondents to our Q&A section, um, the, the first question is, is maybe for Fraser, maybe for Sheik, um, but there's a question just about um, uh, uh, Fraser and your study of other wildlife crossing structures around the state. Um, what was the typical width of those structures? I know you gave, you gave kind of the the general range, but um, I think the question is along the lines of whether Liberty Canyon is unique in terms of 
uh, just you know how large of a of a roadway it's attempting to cover. Yeah, it's definitely uh, unique, and it compared to our other studies were at undercrossings because we don't have a another overcrossing to look at yet. Well, actually, there is another one in Southern California. It's um, across a four-lane uh, expressway, but the our undercrossings varied. Um, mostly between six and uh, close to 100 feet. So six foot culverts to 100 foot bridges. And the structural dimensions didn't seem to play a, a significant role in how wildlife, how many, let's say how many species used the structure versus how many were available in the background. So from an undercrossing point of view, it seems like that's not the primary explanation. For an overcrossing, um, it might be, it's probably, things will be necessarily different, but the approach zones in both cases are basically the same. You have an area that extends anywhere from a few feet to um, half a mile or more uh, into the background habitat where sound and light is permeating and potentially affecting wildlife. So the furthest that we would detect anthropogenic noise is up to half a mile generally. I mean, it varies whether the landscape is flat or, or um, very um, hilly. And then th as you get closer to any highway, uh, it gets noisier and then at night it gets brighter. Uh, so whether you want animals to go across an overcrossing or through a tunnel and undercrossing, they're gonna be faced with that same kind of traffic disturbance. So that, that won't affect things very much. When you get to the structure itself, the structural attributes will be important. And generally speaking, in the global research, overcrossings will pass more species than undercrossings. So they are the way to go. Um, and kudos to District 7 and Caltrans for embracing uh, Liberty Canyon and making it their own, because this is how we get this kind of land bridge, is how we get wildlife across these busy highways. Um, there are uh, several other questions coming in asking about some of the specifications of the Liberty Canyon project. Um, and so I'm wondering if maybe we can provide a link to some more information about that project to folks that are interested. Um, but I do want to make sure that we, uh, we zoom out a little bit and, and talk a little bit more generally about, um, about implications of, of your research, Fraser. Um, but maybe we can start with a question about um, just some, a little bit about your study design. Um, there was a question about the, um, how, you, how your team chose the locations for your camera traps, what factors went into that, and then also a question about, um, about accounting for ambient noise and, uh, you know, um, aside from traffic noise, you know, whether from residences or, or, or other, other human sources and whether that was accounted for in the, in the study. Right. So we looked at basically these paired scenarios where we'd find wildlife crossing structures that um, ranged across a, a fairly uh, constrained set of, of dimensions and types. And then um, these, were, these were all in areas where there was some background habitat. Um, so there are structures, say over a river, where wildlife could conceivably go through, but there's residential development on one side, and so we wouldn't pick something like that. So the structures were picked to fit into that um, box of, of where do where would, will wildlife go through a structure, an existing structure, uh, not necessarily built for wildlife, could be a bridge over a stream, and then where there's background habitat nearby. Um, and then the, the background sampling areas were picked so that the, the um, noise from traffic, noise and light from traffic had uh, decayed substantially, so you really couldn't detected at all from, a, like, say, a sound meter. Um, and so that, so our background areas were the closest habitat that wasn't affected by traffic noise. And then we would distribute camera traps, baited and unbaited, um, across that, that landscape on either side of the structures to get an idea of what um, wildlife were present. And so you can think of that as your menu of wildlife species. And then the ones that actually show up at the structures are the ones that are tolerant enough of the highway and traffic to approach the highway at all and find uh, the structure to go through. In terms of um, local ambient, I saw there were several questions related to 
um, generally and then specifically to Liberty Canyon. We did uh, definitely pay attention to the presence of street lights or residential or commercial building uh, lighting that was nearby. Um, and then also noise that came from, say, uh, another road, um, a minor street away from the highway. But that's all part of the approach environment. So we didn't take those out in any way. Those were all included as part of the ambient uh, noise and light conditions for any crossing structure. And so that means uh, in the case of the slide that's up right now, you can see in the bottom right, there's some residential and commercial areas. Those are all lighted. And so that lighting actually might affect how wildlife move in relation to the crossing structure, which is shown there in the middle, um, and the wildlife coming from the south. So there could be that kind of effect. And um, you know, there's ways to mitigate that effect uh, through shielding or, or using more downwelling light in those locations. So we've, um, we've got a few questions kind of on the different side of the same coin that I think are kind of interesting. So maybe we can wrap them all up. So, so on one side, we have a question about, um, is it possible to, to, to design a crossing for bike pedestrian use that also functions for wildlife um, in terms of getting wildlife across a, a roadway? And then on, on the flip side of that, we have several questions asking, um, you know, is, is human presence on, the, on these crossings designed for wildlife? Is that a concern? Is there a way to, to, um, to control uh, for human disturbance and make sure that people are not using these crossings to, to um, discourage wildlife. So maybe you can, you can uh, address all those wrapped up together. Sure. So the idea generally is you try to keep people out of these crossing structures. Um, we didn't find a significant impact of human presence on, um, on species use of the crossing structures. But we also weren't focusing on that as a question. And so I'm not sure we had a very wide range of numbers of humans, people using the structures. Uh, but in other studies, including um, one of mine that preceded this, there was a significant relationship between human presence and animal presence. Um, and there sometimes seems to be a delay if you have people go through, animals wait for a while before they go through. And there was a large study of recreational trails in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area showing that um, many species tended to stay away from um, trails used by people, cyclists or pedestrians, uh, especially if they had dogs. And so I, I would say given that these crossing structures are so expensive and so, uh, well, not expensive compared to a, um, like a, a F-16 fighter jet, but expensive compared to what we think we should spend uh, because they, they do cost money and they are such a constrained environment to try to put people on there as well is likely a poor use of the place. I think that uh, wildlife are just, it's, there's enough evidence that they're sensitive to people being present that, present that uh, they shouldn't um, be both there. Uh, separate structures should be used for, for people where possible. Um, I think putting them together is generally not a good idea. That makes sense. So um, we got a question, you know, given the, the large investment in some of these structures that you just hinted at and the, the, the long-term, you know, the, these are long-term structures. Um, how can we, you know, in, in, in citing these structures and in designing these structures, how can we um, factor in future conditions like changes in land use, uh, climate change, things like that, to make sure that these are going to be, you know, that where we put these structures are, uh, are going to be the right spots da uh, down the road? That's a little bit, you know, maybe unrelated to the, to the specific research you just talked about, but any, any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, there's, you know, the placement of structures in almost, in most countries, including the U.S. and including in California, is fairly opportunistic. And there isn't really a programmatic or systematic way that structures are being placed uh, for wildlife to get them across highways, which is what you'd want to do. Uh, you'd want it to be systematic if you were addressing climate resilience. 
and I think a lot of it does come back to how much we're willing to invest. So um, if we look at the total transportation budget in California, probably 0.02% of it is spent every year on crossing structures. So uh, one two thousandth of the transportation budget. Um, and there isn't really a wildlife budget to take its place coming from an, another direction. So it's not something that we've really prioritized, even though we, I think we all love wildlife, uh, but we don't necessarily spend the money on it. And that means that a lot of the Caltrans district folks are left trying to get crossing structures included in projects that are built for some other reason, say a lane addition or a big uh, maintenance project, a center divide, things like that. And, and that makes it opportunistic. And that's true for probably every state um, in, in the US. So I think we would change. We would need to change that um, mo. We need to change our modus operandi and and have a systematic layout of where structures could help um, wildlife uh, meet changing climates and do it quick enough that it actually is meaningful. So if we build two or three structures a year uh, when we need a thousand, then we may not be meeting um, the needs of, of the wildlife populations. And there's different ways of figuring out where those locations should be. Um, there's some people use where are wildlife moving based on camera trap or collaring, uh, GPS collar data. Some people use wildlife vehicle collisions as a way of prioritizing um, where these structures should be. Uh, and some use both. One of the hard things, especially in a case like uh, Liberty Canyon, is actually not a lot of roadkill or, or dead animals on this highway. And it's, I think it's because it's just such a noisy, bright highway that uh, animals don't approach it typically. Animals are killed here, dispersing uh, juvenile mountain lions, for example, have been killed here, bobcats, coyotes, et cetera. Uh, but not at the rate um, that you might have if this was a minor highway, one or two lane highway, and you had a lot of wildlife on either side. So if you were to just use wildlife vehicle collision data, carcass data, you might not think this was a great place, however, uh, it is the only place left in this area to build a structure like this and to get wildlife from the Monica Mountains, which is an isolated ecosystem, uh, to the rest of the world. And so we can, we can use these different kinds of wildlife and conflict data to find the best places uh, to build these structures. Um, there's some people who think we should use um, the idea of wildlife corridors and linkages, but Wildlife don't know where those corridors and linkages are. Uh, that's really a GIS exercise uh, to come up with those. So that's probably not the way to go. Uh, but we do have more and more evidence of where wildlife actually are. And so we could use an evidence-based decision-making system to say, where should we put these structures? Um, but all of that is fairly academic if we don't provide the funding. Um, we've gotten several questions about um, about the potential for for you know reestablishing connections across roadways, potentially facilitating the movement of invasive species. Um, can you speak to that and whether whether that's an issue to be concerned about? Um, I think that that's not really an issue. Uh, some people have also brought up wildfire. Is you know this could be a pathway for wildfire, and really. Um, the, although these structures are often, the overcrossings are often vegetated, the density of vegetation tends to be pretty low. It's hard to maintain. You can't really build a forest on a crossing structure like this. It would just be too heavy. So the vegetation tends to be more sparse. Uh, and compared to embers blowing across the highway, uh, that's, that's not going to really work out. And then for invasive species, their seeds tend to be dispersed through wind or animals. Uh, in the case of the highway, the vehicles will actually generate the wind, the eddies that may distribute the seeds. So invasive species uh, from a plant point of view distribution is helped along through other means. Invasive mammals or um, other kinds of animals um, potentially could be helped by crossing structures like these, but um, you know those, those invasive mammals, the ones we worry about, uh, tend to be doing their, a good job of distributing themselves anyway. So I don't think these are going to change that rate of distribution very much. Okay, that makes sense. 
Um, the findings you presented about noise and light, um, you know, there are other human developments that, that also introduce noise and light into the environment, whether it be, you know, energy development or, um, you know, rural, suburban, uh, residential development. Um, do, you, do you think some of these findings speak to um, how the impacts of, of other types of developments besides highway development um, could, could be um, uh, designed to, to, to limit impacts? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And it's, um, it's not just the houses themselves, but also the streets that go with them. Um, in California, only 10% of the paved road system is a state highway. So, you know, there's a lot of roadways out there where there is some lighting. Um, and then definitely with housing development, there's also often lighting. And that can spread out into the landscape in the same way vehicle lights can. Uh, and so addressing those, addressing highways is really important. Um, but other roadways are just as important, if not more so. Uh, they tend to carry less traffic but um, they are going to bring disturbance into wild areas. And then residential development uh, that is well lit, so to speak, um, is definitely impacting the surrounding wildlife and they'll probably tend to stay away. But that may be part of people's desire. Uh, I think um, people, you know, we, we have this, I don't know where it comes from, um, historic fear of the dark, let's say, but um, downwilling light, uh, has been shown to be very effective in both getting that dark sky that we like from stars, but also to reduce light impacts on, on surrounding wildlife. So our research is consistent with previous research. I don't want to pretend that we've you know, really invented this idea. There's pre a lot of previous research that has shown that uh, light and to some degree noise from um, these different low intensity developments can also impact wildlife, birds, mammals, et cetera. Thanks. Um, so th there have also been a couple questions about, um, you know, is it, is it sufficient to, is it, is it kind of an if you build it, they will come type of a situation with, with crossings like this? Or um, are, are, there, are there other steps that can be taken? And, and, and you know, Sheik, maybe you could speak to whether there are other steps being considered for, for Liberty Canyon. But um, Fraser, are there, are there other steps that can be taken in terms of um, uh, uh, Revegetating habitat on 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 the approaches to an overcrossing, or even even kind of actively, um, someone used the word baiting. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, yeah. uh, but actively attracting wildlife to to crossing structures to encourage their use. Yeah, there's um, several questions built into there. Um, one uh, I saw listed a question from somebody at Caltrans, uh, and she asked um, if the if the uh, vegetation immediately adjacent to the structure might be part of the explanation of what, what we're seeing. We did include that in the model, the what vegetation is immediately adjacent to the structure, but it's an important point. Um, I have definitely seen uh, crossing structures, ones that um, were desired to pass wildlife, be cleared of vegetation um, in a big area around each opening with the idea that it helps wildlife see from one side to the other which is helpful for those wildlife that don't care about vegetative cover, but for all the other wildlife that do care about vegetative cover, um, they'll just never go to the, to the structure. So it is important for structures to, for the, for the nearby habitat to go all the way up to the structural opening, uh, whether it's an overcrossing or an undercrossing. And that way it seems like part of the landscape. Um, so that consistency of landscape and habitat all the way up to and potentially through the structure, across the structure, um, is really important for wildlife to not detect a seam. So we want this to be a seamless transition. And some of that can be designed, some of it is just not maintaining the opening uh, in a way to clear all vegetation. Uh, the, con the caveat to that is if you have blackberry bushes that have choked uh, I've seen this in Northern California in a couple of District 2 locations and District 3 where the blackberry is just choking the opening. Uh, wildlife can't get through. So clearing blackberries is different from clearing everything. So I think that making sure that there's that seamless transition is really important. 
uh, and then providing other kinds of structure. I mean, this, this design that's up in front of us on the screen shows on the bridge that there's plants, there's vegetation, so there's structure, there's, it looks like habitat, and that's a desirable, whether it's rocks and, and logs or plants um, growing, it's gonna be important to have that structure go across, uh, that vegetative structure, that morphological structure um, go, go through the crossing structure. But let's see if she has something he wants to say. Sheik, I think you're on mute if you're trying to talk. Oh, uh, <clears throat> no, uh, what was the question? I mean... Just about whether, whether any, any, any other kind of specific, um, specific actions being taken or being contemplated for Liberty Canyon to kind of actively encourage wildlife to use the structure beyond, um, you know, the vegetation and things like that. Yeah, well, uh, Fraser uh, basically, basically covered it all. Uh, only thing I probably would like to mention is uh, the slope from, uh, basically, if you, if you look at it, it's not only the structure over 101, rather it's actually connecting to a tunnel uh, over Agora Road. Uh, and the, the way uh, it, it, that uh, landscaping will be designed so that uh, the slope cannot be more than two to one uh, my understanding is uh, that actually uh, discourages uh, bobcats uh, and what have you to uh, cross that slope if it's uh, steeper than two to one. So that's one thing we're trying to uh, uh, get that for this project, not more than two to one slope. And, and while I've got you unmuted, um, there are a couple of questions about um, the funding sources for Liberty Canyon, which I, I think you briefly touched on in your remarks, but. There, was, there were questions about um, whether any, any federal funding um, was going toward the project and then um, whether what, what the private funding sources are to, um, for the project, if you, can, if you can answer those questions. Yeah, no, uh, so far we don't have any federal funding. Uh, there are some state grants and mostly um, private uh, donations. Uh, uh, of course, I can give you a... Um, estimate uh, or status of the funding because that's the uh, uh, National Wildlife Federation who is uh, uh, doing the fundraising. So, but no, there, there are no federal funding in this project yet. Okay, thanks. Um, Fraser, we had an, another question about, um, you know, g given, given the, the impacts of light and noise on, um, on wildlife that you observed. Can you speak to, um, you know, what if anything that says about um, kind of general statements about um, uh, the impacts of highways on nocturnal wildlife versus diurnal wildlife? Um, and the, the, the person asking the question said, well, you know, there's, you know, on most highways, there tends to be a lot less traffic late at night. So would that mean that uh, you know, a highway might have, uh, or, or that, a, that a, a nocturnal species might be more likely to, to use a crossing structure because there's less noise or something along those lines. Yeah, and there was a related question actually from uh, Fran Pavley, who's a former legislator here in California, who is a big supporter of Liberty Canyon. And that's um, the idea, uh, definitely we're looking at two different phases of disturbance where in the daytime it's just noise, the nighttime it's noise and light, but we also have changing uh, traffic patterns between night and day and it's not just a, you know, there's lots of traffic in the daytime and then there's not very much at night. There's also the shoulder regions where if you have commuters you could have very high traffic volumes in the early morning and in the evening uh, and in different times of the year that could be in the daylight or in the night. Uh, in the dark. So there's a lot of variability in um, how and when these impacts are present. And in general, uh, in previous research and in also um, uh, an investigation done by Amy Collins looking at this, there's a shift uh, towards the time periods when there's less disturbance, when there's less traffic, there's less noise and light, 
And so that indicates that wildlife are trying to avoid those things. If they're shifting towards a darker time of, of night when there's less noise and light from traffic, uh, then um, they're trying to avoid that disturbance. And that shift to nocturnality has been shown uh, in many places around the world in different studies. Uh, and it does indicate strongly that we are having an effect on where wildlife are distributed and their behavior. And so that's really important to think about when you get to these very constrained settings. And so a uh, wildlife struck crossing structure, um, I like a definition of that to be a wildlife corridor. So wildlife corridors really should just be the structure across the highway. So if we think about that, that's a very constrained device. It's got dimensions that you've built. Uh, they can be very narrow, you know, a six foot culvert, or it could be very wide, like Liberty Canyon is proposed to be but it's still fairly constrained. And in that environment and in the approach zone, uh, you'd really want to limit any of these other impacts as much as possible because you're trying to get animals back and forth in both directions across the structure. So the, there is that variation. We are causing wildlife to become more nocturnal so they can avoid us. Uh, and that is likely to have um, a lot of repercussions for wildlife and ecosystems. So I think it's really, um, it's really upon us to, to change that. And especially when you get to the roadside and the highway side where it's a very constrained environment for wildlife. It's a risky environment uh, and so forth. Okay, that's interesting. So um, Sheik, I wanna go back to you. I think um, <laughs> there's a lot of interest in just the, the engineering that goes into building a, a bridge like this one. And so I'll, I'll try to lump a couple questions together. Um, one, one question was about just the, 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 the depth and amount of uh, soil that, that a bridge has to be able to support um, to, to, to support vegetation on the overpass. Um, so maybe you could speak to, speak to the soil depth. And then, um, and then also um, a question about drainage. And given that the the bridge probably isn't porous. What, what, what kind of considerations have to go into designing um, the bridge to allow for, for proper drainage? Hey, Michael, you are breaking up a little, but uh, if I if I understood your question right, uh, basically we're still kind of trying to decide whether it's going to be a two feet or a four feet uh, soil cover on top of the bridge to sustain uh, the vege vegetations. So most likely we're probably gonna be going for about close to four feet of soil cover uh, over the bridge. And, and basically we're gonna to have to have drainage system uh, on the bridge okay. to drain out the water. Thank you. So um, maybe time for just a couple more questions. Um, Fraser, there's a question about um, about non-constructed wildlife crossings. And, and given what you talked about in terms of, um, you know, light levels and noise levels above which, you know, uh, wildlife may, may be discouraged from approaching a roadway. Um, the flip side of that, if there are areas that are, that are, that are, that are dark and, and relatively quiet and see relatively low traffic, um, is, is, there, is there discussion of, or, or is, it a, is it a viable option to consider um, encouraging crossing, uh, encouraging wildlife crossing of, over the, the, the highway surfaces in certain areas and maybe uh, lowering speed limits or doing other things to, um, to make that movement safer? Yeah, uh, it's an inter interesting question. There's um, really two questions in there. Uh, in terms of the, the structures that weren't built for wildlife, but wildlife are using them anyway, I think that that's actually one of the most cost effective ways we could improve wildlife connectivity in California or really in any area that has wildlife. If we make it safe uh, and attractive for wildlife, uh, whether it's through habitat or there was an um, indication earlier of baiting, uh, maybe putting temporarily putting food in the structure itself to draw wildlife in, uh, any mechanism that we have available, if we can use that on existing structures, then we don't have to build a structure in that place. And so if our existing structures are functional for moving wildlife, then suddenly we have a lot of wildlife crossing structures. But they have to be intentionally dealt with. They're not 
intentionally managed for that purpose. Uh, sometimes they're, they're gated, sometimes they're overgrown with vegetation, uh, sometimes the surface uh, may be corrugated um, and it metal and it's not attractive to wildlife. So intentionally managing, managing them, I think is the most cost effective way to, to get more structural connectivity across roadways. And then um, the crossing the roadway itself over the surface, the primary way that that has been thought about um, has been through speed limits, but there's other ideas out there. Uh, Arizona Department of Transportation has a wildlife crosswalk where instead of a crossing structure, there's fences leading to an opening. And then as wildlife are detected, drivers are warned and wildlife's, wildlife can cross over the road surface uh, and drivers have been instructed to slow down if a, if a wild animal is present or nearby uh, that opening. And that seems to be very effective. Uh, it's as effective as a crossing structure. Another idea is that you don't fence with a physical fence and instead you use a virtual fence uh, with um, animal detection systems. And the idea there is that you detect animals in the roadside so you can warn drivers and um, when a large animal or animal of any size is entering the roadway. And that's another um, possibility um, that's out there right now as well. So there's different methods we could use, but generally speaking, speed limits, especially in, in protected areas or areas with a lot of wildlife, speed limits that are enforced are the most effective way to decrease wildlife vehicle conflict over large areas. Um, you really, if you enforced a speed limit over, say, a national park like Yosemite uh, or Yellowstone, then um, your rate of collisions would be much lower, and it would be a lot cheaper to do that than to build structures. It may be politically difficult, but it's certainly going to be much more cost effective. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, well, so I think this we're we're up to our last question here, and maybe it's an appropriate one just to kind of close us out. Um, there was a question. The questioner had, had seen some previous research um, about, um, about wildlife crossings that, that weren't effective. And I wonder if you could maybe just speak generally uh, about, you know, that uh, uh, are or can these types of structures we're talking about truly be effective um, in meeting conservation goals and in facilitating wildlife movement? Um, and, and, you know, I think your research has indicated some of the factors that that would be uh, that, that would help them be effective, but but are there are there other other considerations um, that we should be thinking about to truly make these types of structures uh, effective? Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely the the gigantic unasked question in the field is what do we do if wildlife crossing structures don't actually convey biodiversity from one side of the road to the other. And I think generally across the research that's been done so far over the last 20 years says that they don't. And so if we want to maintain biodiversity, we can't just rely on crossing structures. We can make them better than they are, uh, but I think it'll be very challenging to make them completely effective unless we build very wide um, overcrossings. Uh, so they essentially are land bridges. Another, a um, couple of other interesting ideas. Um, I think in Australia, they experimentally put a road underground for a while and then popped it back up. And so the area that uh, was, uh, that what used to be road became ground uh, and essentially was a land bridge. So putting roads into tunnels is another um, way to think about doing this to create uh, land bridges, and then also elevating roads and in areas, and you see this in Europe sometimes where causeways, and in some places in the U.S., let's say in the Everglades, where roads are elevated onto causeways so that wildlife can freely go back and forth underneath. Uh, this was in, um, also in a paper by Richard Foreman and Dan Sperling, um, the idea of elevating roadways also for human benefits that um, is less dangerous for us. And so there's different ways that we can deal with roadways if we want to maintain that wildlife connectivity and thus biodiversity. But it's really a new way of thinking um, 
that we would need to get to. Uh, if we had co-equal goals of moving ourselves around and protecting biodiversity, I think society has those goals, then we would need to change the pattern and the interactions between roadways and the natural environment. Uh, and I think there's mechanisms to do that, but we would need to make that decision. Yeah. All right, well, um, a lot to think about. Um, I really, we're, we're out of time and I apologize to, to everyone um, whose questions we weren't able to get to. Um, so really, really great questions. I wanna give a big thank you to uh, Dr. Schilling for giving such a great presentation and some really thoughtful answers to those questions. Um, as well as Rebecca and Sheik, really appreciate you joining us and providing your insights. Um, there, uh, uh, just a couple things to close out. Um, there are a couple of folks who in the Q&A or in the chat asked us to provide um, some of the links that were discussed during the presentations. We've provided some of those in the chat box, but I also just wanna remind everyone that the presentation, the slides um, will be posted on our website here um, you know, within the next 24 hours or so. So you'll be able to go back and, and look at all those links that, that were mentioned in the presentation. Um, and then you'll also be getting a follow-up survey via email. Um, and we'd love to, to have your feedback on, on, uh, on uh, how the presentation went and what we can do different for next time. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and, and wish you a, a good rest of your day. Thanks very much.